2016 Zoning Board of Appeals meeting to order. Uh, the first order of business is to approve the minutes from the February 23rd, 2016 meeting. Um, seeing if we have enough people here. I wasn't here. Uh, I think we only have three. I think we're going to have to table that. We only have three. So we have to take, <coughs> excuse me, we have to table the approval of the February 23rd, 2016 minutes until the next meeting. Uh, we have no old business. So the one item of new business on the agenda is to hear the request of Scott and Cheryl Joyes, owner of the property at 10 Star Road, map U22, lot 7, for a variance to section 19-6-3E of the zoning ordinance. A two-story house addition that was permitted and constructed in 2003 is now found to be 15.5 feet from the front property line, while the zoning ordinance requires the addition to be 20 feet. Um, I want to thank the board for taking the time to hear us out this evening. Um, I don't know how involved you want me to get through this. I've talked to Ben a couple times and we've gone through it. Uh, to give you a little background, we, uh, we have an addition that we had permitted on April 1st of 2003 at the time we'd spoken with Bruce Smith. Um, we started about, uh, in January of that year, we started looking at addition. I looked at hiring contractors to do it. Uh, we had our second son was due about two months later. Our home wasn't big enough, we looked to expand it. So we looked for contractors and we just couldn't afford it. We priced it out and they were looking somewhere around 120, $130,000 to do the addition, which was out of our budget. So I contacted multiple people and at the time it was recommended that I speak with Peter Planza of uh, Cape Cottage Homes. Uh, so I'd met Peter at the time and he'd come out to the home and take a look and took some measurements and whatnot and he and I'd sat down and we planned for, we probably sat three or four times down for two plus hours at a time putting together an addition for the home. Uh, we tried very hard to make a home that would be aesthetically pleasing for the neighborhood, to blend it in, to not look like an afterthought of the house. Uh, one of the things that went along with that is we put the farmer's porch on the front to blend it in so it wasn't this kind of two-story monster on the end of the thing that would stand out and look awkward there. Um, it was an afterthought. It's something that Peter had mentioned to us that would blend in nicely. And we looked at it. They put some CAD drawings together. My wife and I looked at it and said, yeah, we like the look of this a lot, and we opted to go with that. Um, Unfortunately, that's kind of where we're here today because it ended up bringing the house forward further than we needed to. We didn't really have any reasoning to bring that forward. We didn't need the space upstairs. We actually ended up with an oversized room on the second floor, but it, it just kind of worked out that way to make it blend in nicely. Um, at the time, Peter had come out. He brought some measuring equipment, a transom. Uh, we measured the property lines and went through, and we did not order a formal site survey at that time. Uh, but he was pretty confident we were good. We did find a monument pin near the front of the property that was about three feet back from the road. Uh, I'd like to be able to show that to you, take pictures and whatnot, but the telephone pole in front of my house was knocked down about 10 years ago, um, and it's gone, so it's not there anymore. When they pulled the pole out, the pin came out with it. Uh, so unfortunately, that wasn't there as a reference point that I could look to, but we did locate something at the time that we put the bill together. Um, before we built, when we sent the, uh, the permit in, Bruce had come out to the house to visit us. Um, he walked the property line, he took measurements, and then I mentioned to him that I was going to be general contracting this myself um, and told him what was going on, and he looked at it, and the only question that he'd asked in reference to the right side setback on the property to our neighbors at 14 Star, were we sure that we had the 10 feet, and we checked that several times, and we were very confident that we were going to be about 12 feet back, which worked out well with the site survey. We were about 12 feet. I got the number here somewhere, but it's well within limits as far as a setback on that right side. Um, it had never come up as a discussion on the, on the front side of the property as far as there being a concern with having to check that or anything. It's just not something that we thought about. We were 24 feet, six inches back from the road at that point in time. Uh, we saw that monument. We felt we were in pretty good shape. Bruce had never mentioned this as a concern to us anywhere along the way, so we just never thought about it. So we completed the addition, we put it back together, they did additional measurements after we did the foundation, filled that in, they came out, measured again. We pressed on, and in October of 2003, it was permitted and we pushed through. Uh, we've been living in there since, living fat, dumb, and happy, and then early this year in March, we entered into a purchase and sale agreement with some folks to purchase our home. Uh, when they came out, they performed a, 
they call it a, it's a real estate survey. It's kind of a casual survey that they do of the property. It's not a complete detailed survey, but at that time they came back and told us the house was 14 feet from the road. At which time we kind of, I've talked to my realtor and I was kind of, I was a little bit bemused to be honest with you. I just didn't think, what are we talking about? We're 24 feet back. This can't possibly be an issue. Um, they reiterate, reiterated the concern, sent up some drawings. I think that they had talked to Ben at the time and Bessie asked him in reference to that and uh, T. Gunther and said basically said that you need the 20 feet and if it was at the 14, obviously that would be a concern. So I called Ben over the house and he t I asked to meet with him. He came by the house, took a look at it. Um, basically at that time he told me I'd have to get a survey to figure out what was going on. There wasn't a lot he could do at that moment. So we we purchased a survey from the land survey that came through and he did a certified survey at which point it was determined that the property was 15.5 feet from the property line on the front of the property. Um, we are still 23.10 inches away from the road, but obviously we've got about a nine foot setback on the road that we never anticipated in any way of looking at it. Uh, they've done surveys of multiple houses in the street. Most of them are four, about three and a half, four feet back, and I'm not sure why my property is so different, but it is. So, which brings us to where we are now. I had met with Ben, talked to him, we did the survey. He advised me my first step at this point would be to go to the ZBA and, and try to grant an after effect variance. Um, I understand coming before you, this is not commonplace to happen. You don't do an awful lot of after the fact variances. They're pretty rare. I've spent quite a bit of time looking through minutes for 20 years trying to find some sort of reference point to this to work with. And there's not a lot of precedent in this. Um, it has happened a couple times that the Zoning Board of Appeals has issued an, an after the fact variance for a very similar concern to this. Um, I did find a couple examples which I would be happy to hand out if you wanted to see it. Don't know what your concerns are. I also found some information I know that they changed the law or the, the amended the zoning ordinance earlier this year to the fact in someone in my situation they would require a survey because this is something that had previously occurred. So now if any addition in, in, in excess of $10,000 in price that's going to be within five feet of setback, you now require a survey. Would have been cheap money in relative comparison to what we've been to thus, thus far. Uh, we've had to commission, the, we've had the land survey done, I've had to consult with an attorney. We've lost the sale, purchase and sale agreement at the home at this point, so we're kind of regrouped from that. Um, we've signed with another home that we're, we're proceeding with the purchase of and puts us in kind of an awkward situation because shortly I'm going to have two mortgages here. And I could survive with that for a while, but if I can't sell this house, obviously that's going to put us in a hardship that's pretty unexplainable. It, it puts pretty tough. We've had knots in our stomach for a couple months about this. Um, I've reached out to all of my neighbors, which Multiple of them are here today. I, I didn't ask any of these people to come. I truly appreciate you being here this evening. Your support means a lot to me. They're, they're very nice people that have taken time. I've spoken with, I believe everyone in my street and everyone that I've spoken with has been supportive to our concerns. I know that Ben has, you, you've given copies of letters. I know Ben got some emails in addition that I had not seen um, support. I don't know of any negative comments that have been received in reference to our concern. Um, I know I, I in the attachment, I put examples of a lot of homes that were in similar circumstances. There are homes that are closer to the road than mine on the same street. Um, obviously, these are homes, they're non-conforming lots, as mine is, and these were built this way a long time ago, so it's, you know, it's not the same thing. I'm looking for something after the fact, but it's not out of character for the neighborhood what's going on. This is not a home that's going to stand out that it's sitting really close to the road. It's a very similar to multiple homes right within six, seven houses of my home. It would be very similar character to other homes in the area. Um, basic where we're at is I'm asking for your help on this. We're in a real bind. Uh, we never tried to put ourselves in this situation. We thought that we did everything we could to make sure that we didn't end up in this situation and obviously that didn't work out very well. So now I'm kind of stuck and I've got to kind of come to you folks and hopefully you can see your way fit to help us out of this, but it's entirely up to you, obviously. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Joyce? So the original application is here, and um, the setbacks are on it are listed as this is your application from 2000 uh, from 2003 uh, front front setback existing 31 feet proposed 24 feet six inches. So it was not built to this. The application? It was built to that, but when we put the setback, we did it to the road, and they have a, I gave you a copy of the blueprint. It's not real clear, but it does detail that the 24-6 is from the road. 
then we put that on there and it is in that packet. I had to take a photocopy of the original because I didn't have it anymore. Unfortunately, would that, would that be this? this that would be right that. So there was a blueprint and they have the full size version up in the planning office upstairs. Um, and that was a photocopy of that that was taken showing the, the 24, six feet from the road as far as was put on there. And that's something that Peter plans had put together for me at that time. Ben, I think he's got the original right there in front of him. Um, so Ben, do we have information where this, this 24 foot six setback is from what line that they've got in the plan? The road. This is the site plan yeah. submitted. Uh, and he, he, he catches the most important part with his photocopy. Uh, this shows what would presumably be lot lines with uh, compass bearings. Uh, it shows the dimensions to each property line. 27 feet from this side. Uh, doesn't show it from the rear. 10 feet 6 from the other side and 24 foot 6 from the front. Okay, so, so that plan is incorrect, or that's, that's the side of the road, not the side of the lot line? My assumption would be they assumed that their property line was the edge of pavement when they did this site plan. And back then site plan, an actual survey was not required at the time. Correct. Is that required now? It is. Uh, a couple of these went to the council a few years ago for relief and the council asked for an ordinance provision to prevent this. Uh, the ordinance provision, as Mr. Joy stated, was if you're doing a project valued at over $10,000 and you're within five feet of the setback line, you're required to get a survey to demonstrate compliance. I do have copies of that if you'd like them. Thank you. um, I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary. Um, is there any other questions for Mr. Joyce? Could you, uh, I, I heard you talk about um, perhaps what you thought was a, a property pin or a monument maybe next to a, a utility pole that's going to move. Can you, can you go back and explain that a little bit? Yeah, on the front property line, and, and I'll be honest with you, that doesn't line up with the the 24-6. The 24-6 was to the edge of the pavement, so we put that number in there. And I, again, I take responsibility. That's shame on me. I didn't know any better. I was working with someone else at the time. Um, at the end of the day, it's my fault. I, but there was a pin that was there previously on the front of the property that lined up with the one on the back side, looking at the thing. I uh, ran along the fence line that we had the fence installed right there that was sitting there. It was right at the telephone pole that would have been, that pin was about three feet, six inches back from the road based on where the pole is right now and they usually put them in the same hole and they put it back in. And it was literally two or three inches from that pole right there in the thing. So look at that, we still would have been in compliance as far as the 20 feet with that pin set back there. Look at And that's what we, you know, that's what I would have assumed would have been our normal property set back. The house across the street had had a survey done when they had their house sold a couple of months ago when we looked at that and did the measurements. If I go by the pin on the front of the yard, yard the yard, yard go to the side of the road and assumed it would be similar in our yard going that, I would have thought we would be within three or four inches of where we were supposed to be looking at that. And obviously we've got a unique circumstance in our property and I'm not sure what the difference is why it's so far back on that side. Um, and, so, and, um, and this came to light because the, 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 the potential owner, his lender, or somebody wanted to do a The lender survey. commissioned a, a, a mortgage survey, survey yeah. that they came out. So they, it's not a full-on survey, but it right. was a... So how do, how do we think they determined, if the, if the pins you're talking about aren't there anymore, how do they determine that? I'm assuming they, they went from the back property line and measured the way forward is where they went through. It would be my best guess as to what they did. Um, I'm not sure they didn't explain to it happened. They gave me a, a kind of a rudimentary drawing. I think I'd given a copy to Ben at some point. I don't have one in front of me. I apologize. It, it was very, it showed the house at, at almost like a, quite an angle that doesn't exist. It's almost a perfect 90. It's very slightly off. And we looked at that and we're, we're pretty skeptical. We didn't really think that there'd be a lot of uh, honesty to it. Went through it. We were quite shocked when they came back at the 15 and a half feet. Um, and so when you purchased the home, what, you, what you, you purchased the home in? 
1999, I believe. Okay. Do you have a similar survey, a similar site survey? We didn't because we'd end up purchasing it from my mother-in-law at the time, so it was kind of an easy transaction. We were actually already living at the home when at the time, and we just said, hey, we just purchased a home for her, so it wasn't, we never thought much about it. We weren't buying it from strangers. We just bought the house from her, and it just never came up as a, th as a thought on it, to be honest with you. I just... Chair, I have two questions. Um, the first is that you mentioned the man Peter. I, well, I didn't catch his last name. Peter Palanza. I, I, unfortunately, I heard that he had passed away a year or so ago, and I didn't know that until I started looking into this. Okay, and at, at the time that you worked with Peter, uh, was he an individual, or what, was it through his company, or did he have a company? Yeah, well, he has a company called, it was called Kate, Kate Cottage Homes, is what it was called. Um, he wasn't my general contractor. He was my planner, set me, and he got me set up and whatnot, so I don't... I, I never went into this thinking that I was going to blame Peter for this. I mean, I... Yeah, he's actually dra he was a drafts person who would design homes. And, and so is that business still around today? Not that I'm aware of, because... So he passed away about 16 months ago, I believe, when I read the obituary of the paper. Someone, one of my other neighbors had mentioned to me that he'd heard that Peter had passed away because he'd gone to school in Cape and knew Peter. Okay. And had heard of it. So. I'm moving on to the next question. Sure. Take a moment before you answer. Yeah. When the, the former code enforcement officer came and looked at the property, mm -hmm. all right, can you discuss the number of times that he went and the time of season, as well as the before, during, and after of the construction? He came, he visited the home. I, 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 could I tell you every time? Probably not, but I can tell you he visited the home prior to permitting, and he came out and visited then. He visited when we, did, when we poured the foundation, came out, and I believe he came out before we poured, and then again after we poured. He came in at framing, um, when we did the when we did the electrical, he, he came in for that. Uh, plumbing, actually, he came in after we poured the foundation. He came in to check the, the plumbing test for the stuff of the floor and whatnot, because we had to do a pre I remember doing a pressure test on the floor drains and whatnot that he'd done at that point in time. Um, and then he came in for an electrical inspection, and then I believe the certificate of occupancy was the final time. So it was at least four times, I couldn't tell you to be exact. Um, but somewhere within that neighborhood, so. And in, in the, all right, I have three questions. Sure. <laughs> I've got all night. <laughs> so in the, the paperwork, there is, There's a, a letter that saw, here it is. It's October 20, 2003. Can you describe how you received this certificate of occupancy? Uh, at that time, Bruce visited the home. He, already, he also brought the assessor in with him, I believe is who it was. Uh, Matt Sturgis, is that who it is? Yes. Um, at that time, and they did a walk through the home um, and went through, did an inspection round, went through, asked me a couple of questions, at which point he said, okay, it looks great, and signed it, and he, we were done. Um, Okay, I have four questions, and this is it. All right, so after the October 2003 letter, mm -hmm. did Mr. Smith ever come back to your property? In reference to the addition, no. Okay. Uh, Strike off the addition issue. Did he come to your property and speak either to you or your spouse or any, any I suspect that he drove by because he, he, that's what he does in town for other properties. So he must have seen the property. But I'm, I'm talking about when he actually spoke to you after October 2003. We built a deck before then or after? Then no, he did not come by the property after that ever. Thank you. Okay, yeah, that was the last one. So no, I, I never saw, saw Bruce again in reference to that. Thank you. Oh, no. When did we put the pool? He did come by my house for a separate, we got a per, I apologize, we had received a permit for the pool and Bruce came out at that point because of the pool, he did visit the house, it had nothing to do with the addition and we never spoke about it, but he did come out to, to give us a permit for an in-ground pool that we did, to approve a permit for an in-ground pool that we put above ground pool in the backyard. I apologize, I had to timeline a little. Sure, and he only came once to, to visit that application. Well, at least once. 
At least once on that that I can think. I can't remember if that was twice or not. To be All right. And do you know what year that would what that would be? Probably 2004. Okay, thank you. Seven questions. I'm sorry? I'm seven. <laughs> kind of follow up questions. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Ben, can we let's wait? Uh, any public comment? Sir? Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Emery. I live at 12 uh, Juniper Lane. I'm not in media to butter and I don't live on the, on the same street. Uh, I did serve on the planning board for nine years and saw many situations where people came in and uh, were sent to either deal with it with the zoning board or with their contractor, so to speak. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes for all the money in the world. Uh, dealing in real estate is bad enough, but having to go through these hurdles. Uh, I'd also say that based on my years in design and so forth, I would say that the, the house fits into the uh, neighborhood. Um, all of that said, um, there's a term in golf when you're playing and you're sort of self-policing, that you're protecting the field. That is, there are many people who have come before your board who have been paid a lot of money for attorneys. They paid a lot of money to correct things. The one that I saw as a planning board member was to the contractor, you're going to move the pool. Uh, the firm I used to work for, which had a survey group, paid to move a house and paid to put people up in a hotel for some extended period of time. And that's why we had liability insurance. Uh, those mistakes do happen. Uh, just for clarification, I, um, there, there seems to be some dis distinction that the plan originally had a, a 20, was a 24 and a half foot setback, uh, and then the porch was added. And the porch actually adds, as you mentioned, it ties the front of the house together. But that, I suspect, then is where the four and a half feet was lost, where it would have taken the, the setback to 20 feet. And parenthetically, does the survey, does what was used as a survey or as a base plan show both the edge of pavement and a property line and show them in a contiguous or overlying the same line? It, it, it shows one polygon, one, it shows a square for the property line. With no, no distincting char dis distinctive characteristics. Yeah, I mean, you can take a quick look if you'd like. Yeah, that, that one doesn't have the actual property line on it. That's the road on well, the front. It, okay. just, yeah. I, I want to be very clear. Uh, as a neighbor and in a situation like this, I would be in a lose-lose situation if I were to oppose this, and I certainly am not here to oppose it. And I, based on my experience, I can't support it. But what I am going to ask of the board is to please be very clear when you uh, deliberate what standards you have to meet in terms of finding a hardship or being able to grant a variance under this situation. Uh, and I think it would be helpful to the applicant as well as certainly myself and others in the audience if you would speak to what responsibilities, if any, the prior code enforcement officer has in terms of going to a property and saying that, you know, signing off on the foundation would be the first thing that I would wonder how that, how that could happen unless he were presented or she were presented with uh, false inf or incorrect information. Um, but that, that would be helpful. And I just wish the applicant good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, my name is Marcia Corradini. I live at 36 Murray Drive, which is the corner of Murray and Star, so I'm about three houses away from Scott and Cheryl. As I said in the remarks that I sent to you, Ben, um, the house is, fits into the neighborhood. It does not look awkward with the farmer's porch or the garage addition. In fact, it brings the house into conformance with more homes in the neighborhood. A lot of homes have been renovated and um, all of them have all been improvements. And Scott and Cheryl certainly did nothing 
um, out of the way as far as that goes. I also know that it's easy to take the edge of the road as your property line because you maintain it to the edge of the road. Um, I, I think that everyone would be surprised to learn that the property line is in their lawn. And so in some respects, we're taking care of the town's property for, for the town. Um, I don't see any point in rationalizing why the former code enforcement officer came up with a different interpretation than you're looking at now. I think most probably the person who put the plan together was not a surveyor, did not look at the recorded survey plan either in the registry or, or here, and felt comfortable when they found a pin that it was a pin they could rely on. So I have no qualms at all about your granting the joys of variance. Thank you. Thanks. Any other public comment? Thank you. Um, open up to board discussion and questions for Ben. otherwise I'm assuming. But it sounds like he he may have checked the side, sent back to the measurement, but that never happened with the front apparently. Is that in your opinion, did he carry out his duties um, appropriately? Uh, he, yes, I I think he carried out his duties appropriately. We we rarely know where property lines are when we're out doing inspections. Uh, it makes sense that he keyed into the side setback because on the site plan it shows 10 foot six, which is within six inches of being legal. And the front showed 24 six. So looking at that, you know, you, you see 24 six and you say, well, okay, they no problem meeting the front setback. That one's not gonna be a problem. Oh, that, that side one's pretty close, though. I, I better give that one a second look. Uh, if, if the front number had been maybe, you know, 20 feet and change or, you know, 21 feet, he probably would have keyed into that a little more and talked about confirming that line somehow, some, similar to the way he, you know, tried to confirm the sideline. But uh, it's difficult for us to confirm setbacks because we rarely know where property lines are when, when we visit sites. Thanks. Next question. Um, should we, should the board deny the variance request? Would the joys have, what would be their other courses of action? I believe their next step would be to petition the council for uh, relief uh, through a consent agreement. Okay. Thanks. All right, I do have some questions to Ben. Is okay. there, uh, I'm sorry, no, I don't know. Um, do you have an earlier version of the code? And, and can you just mention it for the record that the, the setback at the time of either 2003 or earlier, uh, what is the setback for the front setback that we're talking about that Mr. Smith would have looked at? I have a 2001 ordinance was as close as I could get, and the, the setback is 20 feet on uh, 20 feet for local or private streets, which this would be considered a local or private street. And so today, um, the applicant answered one of my questions, and I have at least eight or nine 
times that the code enforcement officer would have gone to the property. Is that something similar that you would have done uh, if the application comes to your desk uh, as the construction is started in, or as an application and then there's approval and, and the, the various stages of the construction? Yeah, he, he mentioned that Bruce might have gone out prior to issuing the permit, which I wouldn't typically do unless an applicant asked me to. Sometimes an applicant asks to come out and check something prior. Uh, typically my first visit to the site is, is for the foundation inspections and, and like he said, the plumbing under the slab, framing, electrical plumbing, right. and then the certificate of occupancy. Um, my last two questions. On the um, plan that you had earlier that you unfolded, is there a date that's on that on that plan, and it, and where did you locate that piece of paper? Uh, this piece of paper was in the property file with the rest of the permits that the Joys have pulled over the years. It's uh, it, it has a date stamp on it, done by our office of April fourth, two thousand three, uh, which is the same date stamp on the permit application received. Okay, thank you. My last question. You mentioned how that the code has changed when there is a construction that's close to um, uh, a setback. And why, can you discuss why the town has, has implemented that new ordinance section? Uh, pre precisely for these situations, to prevent these situations from happening. And is there a code section that, that you can identify that goes with that? Yes. Thank you. Uh, 19-3-3C. Uh, the new code, that's page 29. Page 29. 19-3-3-C-1. Yeah. Oh, and sorry, follow-up question, Chair. Um, do you recall when this new ordinance uh, section came in? There's a reference to a date of 2009, but I suspect that it was um, later. later in 2009 it, it was right around 2013 I, I can't say for sure All right, thank you so go, so going to the actual um, requirements for a variance um, the one I'm having a really pro problem with is uh, number three Practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. And certainly, it fits in with the neighborhood. Uh, it's not an undesirable change in the character. It is due to the unique circumstances of the property. Uh, but I'm having problems with uh, with number four. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I'm sorry. I would agree. So I guess that's was good. With Michael asked about the the, the other remedies available. So it sounds like the the town council had matters like this come before it. So they said, "Oh, wait, we've got to change," and they granted relief for these things theoretically, or maybe they didn't. But then they encouraged the ad adoption of the zoning ordinance that we that we're talking about. The, with the this would have triggered that that desire for boundary survey, a requirement for boundary survey, I would think. This the, yes yeah this this would have triggered that requirement and. and and the, there's one known instance of the uh, council providing relief. Okay. So that says to me that this has happened before and the council has dealt with it in some fashion. So that does sound like they're maybe the other way. 
I mean, the, the problem that I'm having with four is, you know, what we're hearing from Ben is that the former code enforcement officer was basically doing what you would have expected him to do. You would not have, ex you would not, would not have expected him to go out and take the measurement. You would have expected him to rely on the application. Yes. And so once he wouldn't be going out to, after the foundation was poor, he wasn't going to go out to measure after the foundation was poured to see if it was meeting the setbacks. He was going to inspect the foundation. But, but even then, he wouldn't know where the line was. Right. Yeah, I mean, when, when I go out for my first inspection to, uh, to you know, my, my job is to inspect the foundation. Uh, occasionally, I will do a measurement to a property line, but only if there's some sort of red flag or something going on. Sometimes a, a neighbor will call and say, you know, I think that foundation's a little close to the property line. Or, or there could be another reason, but there would, I would only measure from the foundation if there was, uh, if there was a red flag. All right, I have more questions. Um, on the issue of a red flag, there are some things that are subtle, and then there are some obvious red flags. Um, can you give us an example, something that would just jump out at you that you'd say, right, this has to be dealt with even before um, an application is, is approved? Well, like I said, and, and like Scott said, on, on the side setback, when you see someone's building within six inches of a setback, you know, that's, that's an automatic red flag where you're calling the person and saying, hey, uh, you're, you're, you're proposing to build within six feet of the setback. And that may be why Bruce went out prior to issuing the permit. He might have called the Joys and expressed that concern. and and said maybe we should do a site visit and, and just make sure you've got that six inches that you think you have. Uh, so th that's one is when you're really close to a setback that uh, that's a red flag. And, and then the other obvious one is when a neighbor calls and says, I, I think that's close to my property line. Sometimes you could go out and sometimes a property line may be apparent if there's a fence, although Fences aren't necessarily indicators of property lines. If I went out and was measuring a foundation and there was a stockade fence, you know, six or eight feet from the foundation, I would probably question the situation. But uh, th those would be some examples. I mean, same way on the, on the board have arguments that. Um, the practical difficulty was not the result of the an action taken by the applicant. Is that what we're trying to get at? Actually, is that yeah. we're trying to pick, kind of try to get it on to the code enforcement officer almost? Is well, I, no, I just, I mean, I, that was one. That was what I was. That was one thing I was exploring. You know, and that's not even that would. You know, is there some blame that could be shared, or you know, is there something? Because if if the code enforcement officer wasn't doing his job, then and again, I don't know if it would necessarily fit within the language of the ordinance, but it would seem like the town was at fault. There was some you know some some shared you know fault that the the town should have, should have stopped this from being built. But what I'm hearing is that's not really what. You know, the code enforcement officer basically did what the code, the code enforcement officer would be expected to do, which is rely on the numbers that were presented because they weren't close to the setback, at least as presented. Um, I mean, I guess I'm kind of imagining, well, I, that, I mean, that's, that is what it is. So when an applicant comes to the code enforcement officer, submits an application, there's an argument of good faith and it's going to be accurate. Now, this particular applicant is not a professional home builder, as not that we're aware of anyways. And there's a certain amount of reliance on the code um, enforcement officer to understand and interpret the code and the requirements that's necessary for the, to for the town. So oh, it sounds like, on one view, is that code enforcement officer is relying on the application full stop without acknowledging that there may be errors or, or omissions. 
or we're saying that the applicant is going to be relying on the code enforcement officer to interpret the application and the, and the, and the ordinance itself. So it, it, I'm troubled on this one because we have a prior code enforcement officer going through a number of steps and could take any <laughs> a tape measure out and measure. But he wouldn't have even known what to measure to. Ah, so it's a, an ambiguity, if you will, a latent ambiguity at that. Um, and so that the, the reliance of the applicant is on the town. The town allows it to happen. Yeah, I the, disagree with that. I think the that. building is built, and now and now who's and the the, the, the draftsman is now dead and, and no business. So if you're looking for hardship, the applicant cannot sue. The, the person who is arguably well, there are, but there are other avenues of relief to the town council. But as far as but, but you're also, I mean, you are. You, even if it was the fault of, I, I mean, one question I have in my mind: if it was the fault of the builder or whomever was, you know, the, the man who's now passed away, isn't that an agent of the applicant? I do not dispute that. The issue is that who is, at the end of the day, is going to be paying to remove oh, oh no, the front I, of the house. I, and so if the person I, 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 I 100%. OK. I 100% I, I agree. I'm, I'm very troubled by this because I, I, because potentially you're talking about a very large expense to undo this work that was done or, or something. Yes. But and I, I, that's why I'm asking. That's why. Somebody make make a strong argument that this was not due to the owner's um, an action taken by the owner. That's that's the one that I'm getting hung up on. And that, that's uh, let me take one step back. The action of the applicant and it gets into the men's the, the state of mind of the applicant. I was going to say the men's right. So does the person know that it's an error, does or should he have known? All right. Practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant. It action, is. we're not talking about state of mind, we're just talking about action taken by the owner, taken by the applicant. I, I just, I, I believe 100% he thought he thought that was property line. Absolutely. But the variance says the result of the action. And that's, It is what it is. Then, then there's the question of precedent. If we, that anybody can do this. Uh, uh, I don't agree with that. I think we have some fairly unique set of circumstances here. Uh, you'd actually, you had mentioned that you had some prior. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, I'd like to you pass, pass that up. No, no, that's fine. Great. Chair, could you open up for public comment or so we can receive the information? Yeah, you. let's, uh, do I have a motion, entertain motion to open up for further so comment? All right, all in favor, for nothing. Can we? No, 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 we, we should have asked for it earlier, so that's fine. Sorry, could you go to the uh, microphone and then restate what you just said? I, I apologize. The, the, the one other thing I would mention real quickly, anything done before 1997, Ben has the power to fix it on his own. He doesn't even need to go before you folks. For some reason, they brought that ordinance into effect in December of 2003, which was after the time that we completed the addition. So there's a six-year gap there for whatever reason. So had we done this prior to 1997, he could make the call on his own as long as it wasn't below a 10-foot setback based on the ordinance at that time. And I do have a copy of that being here. But so I expect he's familiar with it because it's something the code enforcement officer could do. So had I done this a few years earlier, I, he could have the, it would be within his authority just to say, yep, this is the right thing to do. 
Um, in this case, obviously, it was built after that, so there's not much I can do about it. But it has happened another time. I think I highlighted the section there where there was some precedent for this having occurred. It was a pretty similar situation. I believe that they had gotten a variance, uh, but they were about five and a half feet off at that time on it. And it was a measuring concern of some sort that it had occurred at that point in time on it. So it was a very similar type of thing that was going on there. Um, it does say mentioned as you go to the town, and I've addressed the town council on this prior to this meeting, and they felt that you folks were the, top, were the proper venue to deal with this. And as you look at the discussion on the ordinance when they were coming up, they felt that this was something that you guys could resolve when something like this came up. This was an issue that could go for the ZBA to try to be resolved before the council get involved because they were, it's not something they like to do. There are a couple examples of consent agreements, but they're pretty few and far between. I probably got 20 hours into researching this, looking at minutes forever to try to dig some of this stuff up. But that's just something that, just the things that we see in the past. So. I apologize, I would have put this in with the original packet, no, but I no. didn't find this till after the fact. It was. I, I, okay, do you have any? Okay, any other comment? Mr. Joyce, thank you. Right. So I'll, I'll re reopen the board discussion. Just a couple of comments. So the, the two documents that were handed to us by the applicant, one is the, the minutes from the October 24, 2006 um, zoning board hearing, um, which raised a issue with a property at 7 Crescent View Avenue. And then there's a second document dated August 7, 2012, which is from the um, town's um, town plan of Marina O'Meara. And there's a discussion in there actually on 7 Crescent View Avenue. Um, and then, so this is the, essentially the background scenario that gave rise to the ordinance that we were talking about earlier. Yes, uh, the Maureen O'Meara memorandum was, was written for the zoning amendment for the survey requirement. Thank you.
October 2006, but it seems seems to me that there are some differences between this case and the case before us. Uh, notably, with, with the case on Crescent View that's referenced here, there was there was a variance granted, granted. that right. previously, and the applicant was relying on a survey. Turns out the survey was incorrect, which resulted in the need for a second variance. That to me is different. Is different than before us. Sorry, Mike. What, why is that? Yes, it's another um, legal aspect to the title of the. Of of the land, why do you see as a as a different? Is it a substantial difference, or is it a, another feature of the to distinguish between the two, um, the current application and present view? Well, for one, I, I mean, we don't know a lot of the facts because there <laughs> there aren't there aren't a lot here. But I, I imagine what happened at the time. Uh, the, the applicants, the, the millers, came forth with a, a request for a variance, and it was necessary because of the uniqueness of the property and uh, you know, the other standards that are, are required there. Uh, and, they, and it sounds like they relied on a, a professional survey. which turned out to be incorrect. Correct. Even Whereas this case, it sounds like the applicant prepared the plan. Yeah, I, th I think the Millers relied on a mortgage survey. They came to the zoning board with a mortgage survey, got a variance with a mortgage survey, then a real survey comes out and is a couple feet off. Okay. To me, that's a difference. So there's almost like a higher standard that the Millers um, Millers knew there was an issue. They came to the zoning board for a variance to build in the first place, and they, you know, the case, and then they did. And then it finds out. Then we find out the survey was incorrect. Oh wait. Mm -hmm. So it's not the variance itself. That's the difference. It means it's the effort and the particular person who identified the setback. That's the difference. So the, 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 I raise this because the variance, once it's granted, becomes part of the, it runs with the land. So it's the land, you know, it's a different setback now. So I don't see the variance as the distinction. I see it as it's the title company or whoever that made the, the, the plan that actually made the distinction as to where that property line is for the setback purposes. And then that gets the question, well, is that and the Miller property, um, whose agent created that document? And for our purposes, is it a distinction that's relevant to saying that they should know better versus what we're looking at is that if a homeowner does it himself or herself, then um, they have a different standard of care, as it were. But, So what you're saying, Matt, is that this uh, requirement number three is that in this one case that we've got here, the, the Miller property, that it was a result of an action taken by the applicant, but still a variance was granted. Granted. Yes. What page are you looking at in the ordinance, please? Uh, I'm just looking at the it's actually from the five, the, in, from uh, the five requirements of variances. I mean, the, the board found in that that it was, you know, under three. I'm sorry, under, well, I mean, under the same item, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. I mean, that's, that's what the board found. Right, right. So that was their finding. 
I mean, we can assume that that was the finding because they viewed the mortgage survey as not an action to, you know, the, the surveying of the land for the mortgage, isn't, that was not an action that was taken by the homeowner. That's quite a possibility that they relied on a professional. Uh, strictly speaking, I agree. If you follow the language that's here, there's a problem. And, and there should be no variance, absolutely. Because if we're strictly reading that language, then <clears throat> you can't get around that, that interpretation, that uh, an act by a homeowner or the former owner um, may prohibit any variance. So Then so there's no remedy here before the board. I mean, that, I, right. right. But that's why we asked about other remedies, or what, what other possibilities are there. But I mean, you seem to be going, uh, were you coming up with arguments how to, a way to get around that? Well, uh, I'm troubled that the former code enforcement officer went to the property a number of times. And this is something that is, should be, um, fresh in the code enforcement's mind uh, for determining, determining the setbacks. And he identified one on the side. But, but I mean, we've heard from Ben that that's not something that you would ordinarily even do. Yeah, and I, I can't imagine putting enforcement of that on the code enforcement officer without a without a professional boundary survey. I mean, that unless you, unless the town's going to perform a boundary survey. How does? But that's the today scenario for the code for the ordinance. And so, what has happened is that an earlier application has now been trapped, in in probably a little looser array a way of doing applications. I mean, I don't. I 100% agree, but. There's no language in the ordinance that allows us to grant a variance because they were trapped. To me, that seems like that's for the town council to enter into an agreement, which I would, you know, my opinion would be they 100% absolutely should. But I don't think, I, my reading of the ordinance, I don't think we have the power to do that. Some, when Joanna was on the board um, months ago now, she called up a provision where there was an error that was done by the town or the, by the board itself. It had to do with the variance. I think it had to do with failure to record and notice wasn't, notice wasn't provided to the applicant. Right. And, and I cannot recall the location of the code section that she was talking about, but I thought there's a, a, almost like an estoppel argument there. But see, I, when I, and, and that's the thing that kind of pops into my mind is estoppel. If the code enforcement officer should have been measuring the setback, the front setback, but we've basically heard that he shouldn't have, he, that that wouldn't have been what he was, he wouldn't have been doing that. And Ben, ben wouldn't be doing that now. You wouldn't be taking measurements now. You, you'd see the survey, you, you know, if, if the survey was complete, you'd see the survey and you'd see the numbers that were provided to you. And unless you had some question, unless it was close, you wouldn't do measurements yourself. Right. That's right. I, I typically wouldn't measure because I wouldn't know what I was measuring to. So I mean, so it, even you know, if I went to Mr. Joy's house and you know pulled the tank right. from so the garage toward the road, where I wouldn't know the point that I'm measuring so, to. So even now, the code enforcement officer wouldn't be going out and taking measurements. I did, there's no dispute there because if the applicant would be under an obligation under the code to provide a site a plot plan. Um, um, identifying where the setbacks are. Correct me if I'm wrong, the code enforcement would look at it, make sure that it's stamped by a person that's educated and skilled to do the type of dark drawings, and there's a presumption that that is correct. We don't have that in this, in this particular case. We have a handwritten drawing by a person who's now passed away. Prior to uh, a, a new code uh, section that requires a uh, a sealed or a certified document. Um, I, I just find it peculiar that a lot of burden is being put on the applicant when in good faith the applicant has come to the town and said, right, here's my application, tell me what's wrong with it. If it's not wrong, I'm entitled to get a building permit. And, and so, uh, yes, if the guy has grass all, all the way to the street, 
That's misleading for where the property line. But whose fault is it now? Is it the applicants or, or it's the town? Uh, when I say the town, it's arguably the former code enforcement officer and whoever goes goes out to um, out to look at the property. So it's not an action. This is not this is not an action taken by the owner because it's complete. That's was it intentional to deceive? I don't know. Was it reckless? I don't know. And that's why I asked the you're, state of mind requirement. Bringing, what type of action this, are we talking about? But you're bringing in language like reckless or intentional, like it was the owner who did the. And it gets back to, if I read it strictly speaking, there is no variance option here. Because any action by the applicant, whoever signs the application is stuck to the information that's provided. We don't have an errors and omission comment. But if there's an error, when you read through the application, you should be informed and educated enough to spot the error. The argument is that when you go out to the property, where do you perceive this, the property line starts for the purpose of setback? You know, this is 2003 now. I mean, who knows? Just briefly, I'm not sure if the remedy to the town council is really a remedy. There's more uncertainty. Yes, it's a procedural option, but this, it, that could be the only remedy. It's not really a result that resolves the issue because it could come down to yes, it comes back to us for a variance or will be um, you have to take down the structure or well, that portion that offends the setback. Uh, when you go to the property, the addition, you know, it, it does appear somewhat close to the road, you know, just from looking at structures all the time. Uh, the utility pole is only about 20 feet from the front of the addition. Uh, so, you know, an, an argument I I would like to say that you know back then you, you know you, you walk up to inspect and you see well that looks a little close you could pull to the utility pole which you know is in the public right of way and you could see that there's at least you you'd know for a fact that you're not 24/6 that you, you just pull from the foundation of the utility pole you're in the ballpark of 20, which could have created a red flag. Uh, would I have picked up on that? I'm not sure. I, you know, I think the thing that threw Bruce off was the side setback. That that's what he keyed into. And the front setback had four and a half feet of play. And so it just wasn't in his mentality to, to focus on the front. But one could argue that with the utility pole 20 feet from the property line, uh, that he could have picked up on that. And, and then measured because and, he, and then, you know, it would have, it, it, it may have raised, a, it, it possibly should have raised a question in his mind as to the front set. Yeah, and, and the only other fact I would point out is in the zoning board meeting in 2006, a zoning board member asked the former code officer what could be done in the future to pre prevent such errors from happening. And he states that the most he could do is continue to instill to future applicants the need to be accurate with site plans and surveys. The minimum allowed currently is a mortgage survey. And this is 2006. This is and after, that, right? And that, that was after, so that may have been a, a policy change due to something else. When was the telephone pole removed? What year? Do you recall? It's after 2003 or before? After. So that theoretically could suggest a signal that that that. that Power, the 
telephone line on the power the telephone pole was on an easement. Right. Or well, ben, ben has just explained that yep. that may have been something that would have caused him concern and enough concern to measure. Of course, if there's enough concern to measure, I mean, really what Bruce should have done then is, you know, suggest to the homeowner to get a survey because, right, if, if you saw, if, if you had a question, you can't just measure the open land, you have to have a survey to see where, where the property ends. Correct. Right. But that would be after he came back to, to do the foundation inspection. Because the permit would have been granted with just the drawing of the 24-6. Correct. Although Bruce was out there before. Yes. So in this, in this instance, Bruce actually was out there looking at the on the land, looking at the side setback. Right. And I mean, to me it seems, I mean, why? I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that the code enforcement officer was so focused on one, one setback while not considering all of them. At least, you know, if there was something that potentially should have caused him at least some concern. I mean, generally I'm troubled by the fact that, you know, a, a very large expense could be imposed on a current homeowner based on You know, even arguably a, a, an error by a code enforcement officer or not following best practices as the code enforcement officer. I, I think you know the language and no other feasible alternative to a variance is a well, I'm sorry. Um, the practical difficulty is not a reason, not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Can we do? Can you interpret that to bring in the former code enforcement officer's actions? So he's sharing some of the responsibility. Was there, I, I don't recall specifically Mr. Joy's statements, did, did, did you state that the code officer came out prior to doing the foundation to review setbacks? Okay. Can you testify to that? I, so I mean, we, you have a code enforcement officer who's going out to observe setbacks before issuing the permit and seems to be really focused on one when if you're out there, why would you not be looking at others? Particularly if there's a telephone pole that indicates that it's not right up to the park, it's not right up to the street. But does that get us to, you know, it's not the action taken by an applicant or prior owner? Look at it this way. If you read an action taken by an applicant, any application for variance cannot be granted where the person participated in any action that necessitates a variance. I just find that um, peculiar. I, I think I just read this had a circle argument there, but the point being is I'm, I'm troubled that it's, it's um, strict liability. Any action, there's no variance. And that seems a little a higher standard for variance purposes. Uh, when I say strict liability, strictly speaking, there can be no variance if an action by the applicant or the former owner. Is, is what caused the need for the variance. Yes. I mean, obviously, if it's, if, okay, yeah. So what you're saying is that section of the zoning ordinance is kind of problematic. Well, I think you're saying interpreting it strictly in, it, in its most strict sense. But, but I mean, you know, aren't we supposed to use the plain language of the ordinance? Plain language is the plain language. It's not 
It's not ambiguous. I mean, the language of the ordinances. Well, and I mean, and the 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 ordinance was changed be, in in part to clarify and to avoid these types of situations. But at the time, the ordinance was what the ordinance was, and. How, how do you, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. How is it not? I think that's, that, was the first, that was the question that I started with, you know, an hour ago. Um, can we just park that discussion? On the voting, to have this, it's, it, for, to approve this application, it has to be for nothing, is that correct? Because we have a quorum of four voting members. Right. Mm. Okay. To approve, right, to approve the variance. Well, I mean, to poll, I mean, or, where's the guys? Uh, so I, I, I feel terrible for the joys. I think it's a horrible situation. Um, and I appreciate sort of the discussion trying to find a, a way to approve it. But at the end of the day, um, the way I see it, the applicant built an addition 10 feet into the setback. So I don't, I, I, I'm not sure I can support these arguments that the, the, code, enforcement or the code enforcement officer is, is responsible. Yeah, it was, it was four and a half feet in from the setback. Just okay. Just Sorry. So for the four, four and a half feet. Four and a half feet. It was nine feet closer than the application stated, which was four and a half. Okay, yeah. Four and a half feet encroachment. And I think we're kind of tying ourselves in knots, trying to figure out to get a way out of it, and we're kind of taking the former code enforcement officer, throwing under the bus almost for for what Ben was saying that we you know wouldn't be normal practices. And in my, in my mind, the, uh, probably a consent agreement with the council is, is the appropriate way to, to do this, I, I think, in my mind. And I think based on uh, other things here, that that's something they hopefully would be open to. Because they changed the, they changed the zoning ordinance to, 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 I mean, to yeah. correct it. So yeah. that recognizes these things happen and that there have to be remedies for them. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm t trying to twist myself in, in knots to get around three. And the fact that, I think just the fact that I'm, you know, we spent like an hour, I'm trying to convince myself, find a way to, to meet that, that it wasn't the, the, um, a the action by the owner. And I, I, I don't think I'm comfortable saying that it was not. So I guess to answer your question, I don't think we're going to have four in favor of the variance. Unless it's a really good argument that you're holding in your back pocket. I'm, I'm troubled with um, 1952B1C. Um, and that's the result of the action taken by the applicant or prior owner. What page of the new? I'm sorry, page 49. Um, and the reason that I'm troubled here is that this is that uh, subparagraph C at the bottom. It doesn't seem fair that a homeowner, a current homeowner, is precluded from seeking a variance due to an act of a former owner. I understand that it says that. It just seems, yeah. But but you're you're arguing about the fairness of the ordinance, and that's not our job. To no. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so I I take your points. I, I get it. I, I just don't think that that subparagraph C is drafted correctly. Um, but we are our hands are tied. I, I just there's no overt evidence to show that the former code or, code enforcement officer made an error. Um, 
the circumstances of the property arguably are misleading at the time, because the, whether there was a telephone pole or not, whether the, the grass goes to the edge of the road. Unfortunately, we don't have the draftsman available to talk to us. It, the only, sorry, I guess there would be two options. One is that you go to the, the town and ask for a consent agreement. I guess, is there not an option to go to the Superior Court? But perhaps not. Um, it is what it is. I'm, I'm just troubled that I, I, mean, I too, I, I can't get by that subparagraph C at, as currently drafted. Okay. I um, guess I would entertain a motion. Make a motion to deny the request of Scott and Charles Joyce for a variance for a two story addition constructed in 2003 at 10 Star Road, map U22, lot 7. A second. I'll no second uh, Any board discussion on the motion? favor okay so for nothing um, the board has voted to deny the request of Scott and Charles Joyce for a variance for a two-story addition constructed in 2003 at 10 Star Road map u22 lot 7 um, I guess we'll do the findings of fact um, one is Scott and Cheryl Joyce are the owner of record of the property located at 10 Beacon Lane, map U22 lot 10, 10 Star Road. 10 Star Road, map U22 lot 7. Uh, two, the subject property is a non conforming lot in the RC zone. Three, the zoning ordinance section 19 6 3E requires that the front setback to be 20 feet. Um, four, Scott Joyce applied for a permit and it was approved to construct a two story addition. Um, 24 and a half feet from the property line, front property line. Five, the addition received a certificate of occupancy on October 20th, 2003. And six, a recent survey shows that the addition is 15 feet, six inches from the front property line. Um, and I, we don't need the additional findings of fact um, since it was denied. Um, all in favor of those findings of fact? So they're approved for nothing. And I, you know, I, I, I'm troubled by the language of the ordinance, which has put the board in this um, position. And um, I would hope that if, uh, you know, this is taken up by the town council for a consent decree, it seems like this is exactly the type of situation um, that was um, discussed in this August 7th, 2012 memo, which led to the um, uh, revision of the zoning ordinance. Um, and it would seem like it, this is definitely appropriate for um, a decree from the town council um, for some relief for the homeowners. Yeah, I mean, Matt's right. There is a superior court option as well. You, you may want to have one additional oh. finding. Uh, you could probably just use number three as your sole additional finding. So we, would we want to actually read one, two, Four and except one, two, four, and five as you could do yeah. that. Do all of them? You could do yeah. Either way. Well, well, meaning complying with f um, one, two, yeah, four, one, five, two, four, five, and six. Five, six. Sorry, Chair, could you have a suggest a motion to open up? I, so would somebody like to make a motion to reopen discussion on additional findings of fact? Um. All in favor. All right, we're now discussing additional findings of fact. Um, we can add the points that you raised um, with Ben. Um, so now that just goes back into this yes. run. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it, it would make sense to make those additional findings just to have the most complete record yes. as possible. Yeah, and yes. say in, in a positive way. Like say yes. It complies in these, okay. in these, these sections. Um, so additional findings of fact, uh, the need for a variance is due to the unique circumstance. 
Is that, I'm sorry, is, is the need for a variance through the unique circumstances of the property? Yes, yes, because it's not in compliance. Not because of the neighborhood, it's just because of that property. Be Explain that. I mean, prior to construction, I, I guess what we're talking about does this apply prior to when the addition, the, the addition. Built or today? Right. Because it, I think Aaron's looking at it today. It's unique because it, it needs a variance because it's right. But that doesn't unique, uh, right. not because there's five foot setbacks in the entire neighborhood and they're trying to get closer. If this were coming to the board. And the proper and the addition had not been built. Mm -hmm. We're not approving it at all. Period. End of sentence. Right. So we'd, we'd ask them to move it back. Right. I mean, we, we would not we would not approve any variance to go at all. And and this to me would have been one of the reasons. So I that that to me is not a finding of fact. Okay. That I, I would vote for. Um, but I, what you're saying what that you're saying then is that. That even if we didn't find it not no, granted no variance under number three, we would have granted not granted one under number one. Potentially, okay. I, it's a, by two cents. It, why don't we just say that the, there is a need because of the unique circumstances of this property, okay? and include some of the language that you talked about at the end uh, uh, after we had approved the earlier version. Saying that, talking about the consent decree. My dicta. Yes. Yeah. Because those points, I think, have weight that could assist the applicant going forward. And that's a finding of fact, because we're all troubled here on, on this application. These are findings of facts, and the, we, we perceive that they are. That addresses those two uh, points of what is a unique circumstance. Oh, I'm sorry, your, your two. Uh, whether it's unique then or unique currently, because it's not, I know a variance is not available. So there is a variance or consent degree is required due to the circumstances of the property. So you're suggesting instead of one, some language say, I mean, the problem though is these findings of fact match the language of the ordinance. And findings of fact that don't match the language of the ordinance, I, I don't know how helpful they're going to be. It's not helpful if it's not in there. Uh, right. or, or part of the record for, for that right. matter. Okay. Um, so I'm content with the findings of fact of the one through six. Which we've done, right. Yes, and then we're looking at other points that you wanted to raise or include in the discussion, hence the additional point. Right. Uh, but I guess, I guess my, com my general comments, I don't know if I intended them to suddenly become findings of fact. I take your point. Um, if, if you, appropriate relief is needed due to the unique circumstances of the, pro of, the, of the property. Right. Is that? I agree. Okay. Can we strike the first the need of the variance, or you don't even want to use the uh, appropriate remedy as needed for, the, for this property? I, I would agree that some appropriate remedy is needed um, due to unique circumstances. I would not say of the property, but I would say unique circumstances. Um, of the application? Of the unique circumstances of the unique circumstances of, of the application, sure. That ties it all. I mean, that, every, that, that's everything. Okay. So a proposed fi additional finding of fact would be the need for a variance. There is a need for a variance due to the unique circumstances of the application before the board and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood? Yes. Um, another additional finding of fact would be 
granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimentally affect the use or market value of abutting properties. Um, for no other feasible alternative to a variance is available to the petitioner. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't agree with that. That wouldn't, I mean, I, I mean, we've just discussed some other, okay, so not for. Um, the granting of a variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. Um, and the property is not located in whole or in part within shoreland areas as, as described in Title 38, Section 435. So all in favor of those additional findings of fact? Any other? Did you do three? Did no. Because oh, we don't, okay. we didn't find that. Okay. Um, so you didn't want to find it in the? No. Okay. I don't think so. Sure. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thank you for your time. Um, any other? Uh, motion to adjourn. All right. We're adjourned. <laughs>